Are you good at math? Uh, when I was a boy, I excelled at adding, subtracting, and multiplying. I was okay with division and fractions, but geometry. In this branch of mathematics, I proved that I am spatially challenged. Now today, I still like adding stuff up. Uh, I'm our family scorekeeper when we're playing board games or dominoes. And uh, I enjoy statistics, especially related to sports. But shapes, anything to do with circles, squares, triangles, it's still a challenge. In fact, it has been suggested to me that I need to develop my skill by practicing on those animal-shaped puzzles for infants. I'm not so sure it'll work for me, but maybe it's worth an attempt. You know, many people struggle with math. Um, the other day, I was in a store, and the young cashier told me, your purchase is going to cost $4.80. So I'm thinking, I don't usually carry a lot of cash, so I gave her a $5 bill and a nickel, right? 505 minus 480 would mean I get a quarter back. Well, this poor young lady looked at me as if I'm an old, poor mathematician, and she said, oh, it's 480, sir. I only need $5. I said, I get it. I'm giving you 505 so I can get a quarter back instead of two dimes. She was totally confused. She was totally bewildered. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to give you the $5. Give me two dimes. Uh, and I think the people behind me uh, were quite pleased that we didn't continue that discussion. Uh, years ago, I, I played golf uh, with a fellow um, and on a particular hole, it might take him seven or eight shots to put the ball in the hole. We would ask this fellow, how many shots did it, did it take you on this hole? And he would cry out, four. And we all figured he either couldn't count or he was cheating. And it might have been a combination of both. Now, when it comes to poor mathematics, what about Naomi? Naomi, as uh, Jillian told us, is a key character in the book of Ruth. You know, it has been said that the hardest math of all is to count your blessings. Did you get that? The hardest math of all is to count your blessings. Naomi was real good, almost at expert status when it came to counting her burdens. But she found counting her blessings very difficult. But you, could, you and I can identify with her, can't we? Why is it so easy to count up our burdens? Some of you already this morning in this service have been focused on the difficulties, the problems, the trials, the struggles in your life. For some of us, that's our go-to positioning. That's why I've entitled this morning's installment from the book of Ruth, Count Your Blessings. Uh, Jillian gave us a really good recap of where we were last week. Uh, Naomi suffering this cluster of losses uh, in Moab, losing her husband and her two sons who had married Moabite women. And then we looked at these uh, conversations, these compelling conversations uh, between uh, Naomi and her, uh, her two daughter-in-laws. Um, in, in the first case, we see her moving from relief. She heard that there was food in Bethlehem, but relief ended up turning into grief when Naomi said to the two women, uh, it'll be better for you returning to uh, Moab than coming with me to, to Bethlehem. Uh, and then we, we see this uh, second stage of dialogue where uh, Naomi is arguing with them because they want to go with her back to Bethlehem. 
Uh, and in this uh, case, she then shifted to some accusations about God. Uh, God is to blame, uh, Naomi concluded, for the mess that she was in. So we had a chance to look at what Naomi felt about herself. She felt that she was worthless at this point in the story. She felt that God was worth blaming. God was a great boy, a cosmic boy, who had treated her like an enemy. And that's where we finished last week. Uh, This morning in the passage Ruth read, let me give you a very simple outline. The outline for this morning is what I'm calling a risky choice, Um, and there's going to be some math in it. We're going to be talking a little bit about some subtractions, and then if you'll remember those equations where in math we had greater than or less than, we're going to look at a few of those equations under what I'm calling a risky choice. And then the second section I've called a radical commitment. Uh, This is loyalty multiplied. Or those of you who remember exponents, uh, this is like loyalty to an infinite degree. And then we're going to close the day's message with what I call Ruthian mathematics. Or just simply put, count your blessings. So if you've got your Bible, please turn to Ruth chapter 1. It'll be on the screen behind me as we pick it up once again at verse 14. So we see in verse 14 a very emotional scene. If you've got Kleenexes, you might want to bring them out because you see this grieving. Not only has Naomi lost her husband and two sons, but now she's prepared to separate from her daughter-in-laws Ruth and Orpah. So there's the grieving, but there's also the leaving. Uh, Orpah is uh, going to make a choice to leave Naomi and Ruth. And then you have Ruth, as we read at the end of verse verse 14, uh, Ruth clung to her. Uh, This is the same verb that we get the word cleave. And this is a marriage term. So you remember in Genesis 2. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. It means to be glued to. It means to be stuck to or attached to a person physically and emotionally. Now, here's where there's some tension in verses 14 and 15. On one hand, you have Orpah, and her submissive obedience. On the other hand, you have Ruth and uh, her stubborn loyalty. You get the bit of conflict there? Submissive obedience on one hand, uh, stubborn loyalty on the other hand. And we ask the question, so what was good and what was bad? with these options. Now, if you and I had the chance to intercede on that scene, we were a roadside reporter, and we had a little interview with Naomi and asked Naomi, so what do you think is the right choice? The choice that Oprah has made or Ruth is making, I guarantee you, Naomi would have said, it's the choice Orpah is making. Uh, These two women have carried out their responsibilities to me. I have nothing I can give them or offer to them. The best choice is for both of these women to return to Moab. Did you notice in these verses, Naomi did not cry out to uh, Orpah in the distance and say, Orpah, come back. You need to follow the example of Ruth. This is the optimal example. No, she said to Ruth, Ruth, you need to follow Orpah. Now, this isn't how many of us learned this in Sunday school. In Sunday school, I was taught that Ruth was the good girl and Orpah was the bad girl, the bad girl for returning to Moab. Let me just caution us when it comes to comparisons. 
Uh, we love to compare, and in the Bible, there's a lot of people who love to compare. Do you remember the story of Mary and Martha, where Martha said to uh, Jesus, get Mary into the kitchen. She's just being a, a lazy person here, listening to you while she should be helping prepare the meal. Or do you remember in John 21 with John and Peter? Uh, Peter says to the Lord, okay, you told me about my future. What, what about John? And to paraphrase John 21, Jesus says to Peter, uh, Peter, you need to mind your own business. This, this is now about you, not about John. Don't worry about John. You need to be focused on me. And we can do the same in the Old Testament. A, a lot of people like to compare uh, Ruth and Esther. Uh, who is the more godly woman, Ruth or Esther? It has become real trendy these days to compare Esther with uh, Daniel and his buddies. Um, who made the right choice? Esther in her situation in Persia or Daniel and his buddies, <clears throat> the choice they made in Babylon. And I suppose we could compare Ruth to Orpah, who made the right choice. Well, I, I, I just caution us about comparisons. And the author here, I believe deliberately and intentionally, lets Orpah fade off the scene. He doesn't make an editorial comment. He doesn't say, oh, she was terribly bad for that submissive obedience. But I am prepared to say it's not a matter of a, a good and bad choice, but a, a good and better choice. You see, Orpah, the choice for her was security, safety, and what seems sensible. It really did seem sensible to return to Moab. On the other hand, Ruth's choice uh, was very sacrificial. It would be dangerous and risky. Sometimes the better choice in the Christian journey isn't the safe choice. And there's a couple of other things I'd like to address here. One has to do with the, the, the idea of burden. Uh, if you had asked in the same interview, uh, Naomi, um, what do you think about burden? Do you, do you think Ruth, if she sticks with you, is going to be an asset or a liability? At this point in the story, Naomi would say Ruth is going to be a liability. This clingy woman is going to drive me crazy. She is going to be a liability. She didn't see Ruth as an asset at this part of the story. But even deeper, Naomi regarded herself as a burden. Ruth returned to Moab. There's, there you're going to find security. You're, you're going to find safety. you got a much better chance of finding a husband and having children. So for Naomi, she saw herself as a burden. Which, which leads to another issue, and that is the issue of... Uh, uh, of self-reliance. Naomi was prepared to go it on her own because she thought she was worthless and a burden to others. I love this quote from John Stott. Some of you are familiar with John Stott. It comes from his book, The Radical Disciple. I sometimes hear old people, including Christian people who should know better, say, I don't want to be a burden to anyone else. I'm happy to carry on living so long as I can look after myself, but as soon as I become a burden, I would rather die. But this is wrong. We are all designed to be a burden to others. You are designed to be a burden to me, and I am designed to be a burden to you. And the life of the family, including the life of the local church, should be one of mutual burdensomeness. Now there's a word for you. Burdensomeness. And then Stott quotes from Galatians 6. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Hey, did you notice a shift? It's not count your burdens, but it's carry each other's burdens. You see, Naomi 
in her depression fell into self-reliance. For Naomi, there, there was a mathematical equation. One is better than three, and now with Orpah off the scene, one is still better than two. Isn't it ironic that years and years later, Naomi would have someone she was connected with, a fellow named Solomon, who had spent a whole chapter in a book of wisdom literature arguing two is better than one. Call that basic mathematics. But in life sometimes we need to be reminded that two are better than one, three are better than one. Whether it's a marriage, whether it's being part of a church community, uh, the dynamics of family, two are better than one. Just another quick aside, yes, you're right, I believe in this passage, Naomi would likely have failed the course Evangelism 101. Did you see what she says to, uh, to Ruth? Look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. That's what I call a real wholehearted uh, approach to evangelism. Go, go back. You're, 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 you're better off. Go back. The, the gods of Moab, the main god, was Chimath. Um, so she was quite convinced that that would be her better choice. Now, it's a bit confusing here, isn't it? Because earlier in chapter 1, Naomi has said to both women, I'm praying that my Lord will bless you, even in Moab. And, and we know that God's everywhere, right? Um, so, so why did she say to uh, Oprah and Ruth, go back to, to your God's? Well, keep in mind here, surprise, Naomi doesn't have the best opinion of God at this point in time. She's not going to be able, with integrity, to give a wholehearted endorsement of God. And before we throw Naomi under the bus, or maybe under her donkey or under her camel, uh, we have that tendency, don't we? On Friday, I'm talking to a, a woman at the Y that we've got to know. Uh, she has Muslim background. At our foot care specialist on Friday afternoon, here's a woman that we deal with who is uh, of Hindu background. Then I'm talking to a relative of a neighbor. I would say she's got no religious background. And it's so easy for us to think it's so much better for you to kind of stick with your own people. It would be such a risk, such a step for you to, to become a Christian, what you'd have to give up, uh, maybe some ostracism or whatever. Can I say this just as an aside? Do you believe that everyone needs Jesus? Does it have to do with a person's cultural background or where they're from or what God they might serve? There's only one name upon which people can be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. So think of this difficult choice for Ruth. Forget the group's name. It is a group most of you won't know, but there was a popular song, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Uh, if you know that song, I'll pray for you. Um, in any event, should Ruth stay or should she go? Uh, she would be going to Bethlehem, a stranger in a foreign land. What about the risk of racism? Do you think Ruth would have looked different than most of the people in Bethlehem? She would have. She herself was a widow. She was poor. She was in poverty. A great danger. And then you know what the kick in the can is? Orpah doesn't even want her to go with her. You talk about feeling like you're an outcast. Your own mother-in-law doesn't want you. I don't know what kind of relationship you have with your mother-in-law or your mother-in-law has with you, but we'll just leave that alone for the moment. It would be very difficult for someone like uh, Ruth at this moment. So what in the world is she going to do? Well, we kind of sang this song. We had Jillian read it so well. 
Um, I get a bit of goosebumps when I, I, I see Ruth's radical commitment. D- did you pick up on her words? Uh, don't urge me to leave you. Quit bugging me about this, Naomi. I'm going nowhere. I am stuck to you like glue, whether you like it or not. And then she says, where I go, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. And if I don't follow through on this, may the Lord deal severely with me. You want to talk about accountability. Look at this list. I call this loyalty multiplied. It has to do with location. It has to do with lodging. It has to do with her adopting the lineage of Abraham. I had to get an L word in there. The lineage of Abraham. She now affirms the God of Israel as her Lord. And then she says, even in life and death. Naomi, you might die, and you might be thinking now, Oh, when I die, Ruth will head back to Moab. No, that's not going to happen. I'm here for the long term. And when I'm buried, I want to be buried right next to you. Because I'm attached to you. I'm with you through thick and thin. What a, what a vow. And, and Ruth uh, maybe anticipated what one of her great-great-grandchildren would do again in, in Ecclesiastes, talking about the seriousness of vows. And boy, when I officiate a, a wedding, I'm always very conscious of the fact of the seriousness and, and, and just how profound vows are. Um, I, I've actually officiated a couple of weddings, if you can believe it, where the couple has adopted uh, this statement from Ruth chapter 1. And it's been kind of a, a cool experience for that promise to be made to uh, one another. Was this a confession from Ruth based on how great Naomi was? Or was it in spite of Naomi? Uh, I kind of lean towards maybe in spite of Naomi. Some have asked, is this the moment of Ruth's conversion? Now that's a bit of a difficult question when you're dealing with Uh, redemption history, the Old Testament, the New Testament, but uh, my answer is a qualified yes. This is a a wonderful moment, and if you want to have some music accompaniment to this chapter, um, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back might be a really good fit uh, in this part of, of the story. And if you're like me, you're going, but Naomi's witnessing was poor. You already said she failed evangelism 101. And isn't that what's marvelous about God? Isn't it marvelous that conversion doesn't depend, or regeneration doesn't depend on how well someone has done in sharing his or her faith with you? In fact, I'm going to suggest that somewhere back in Moab, Naomi said enough about her God to make an impression on Ruth. And here's another thing I know. That God I referred to, God of uh, Moab, was a very impersonal God. You didn't think of a personal relationship. And and in this case, I think Ruth is thinking, yeah, I get, Naomi, that you're going through a rough period with your God. But man, it's a personal relationship. You can be honest with him. You can tell him that you're angry and bitter. And here's Ruth saying, I want something like that. But before we get too excited, did you notice Naomi's response? Uh, At this point, I'd be going, where are the balloons? Where are the streamers? Where's the high five? Naomi to Ruth going, wow, you're now part of the family of God. Hallelujah. I read in verse 18. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. What a downer. Like Naomi's going, okay, uh, I guess guess you're with me. I guess you're attached to me. Uh, The level of excitement uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Well, let's look at uh, the last section. Finally, they arrive in Bethlehem. It would have been a dangerous journey, actually, from Moab to Bethlehem. They enter into Bethlehem, and we're told everyone was stirred. 
Uh, the men were likely out in the fields because it was harvest time. The women would have been doing business in the town. Uh, we sing, oh, little town of Bethlehem. We're not talking about a big metro metropolis back there. It would have been a very small village. Uh, but to be stirred is to be excited. Uh, this was unexpected. And then they call out, can this be Naomi? Um, maybe she had aged, although she was only way a decade. Um, maybe it was just out of surprise. Um, but I'm sure as they whispered, the women among themselves, they said, man, can, can, can you get some balloons? Can, can, we, can, can somebody bake a cake? I mean, this is a, this is a celebration. Uh, we, ha we need a party. But Naomi, her idea of a party was a pity party. And she was going to be the host and the guest of honor at her very own pity party. Those words, don't call me Naomi. Remember last week, Naomi means pleasant. She said, don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. Some of you who are familiar with uh, Jewish Passover may have an idea of what we mean by Mara. Mara means bitter. I'm not pleasant. I am very, very bitter. Uh, she goes on and says, uh, I have uh, been dealt with uh, in a way that's very severe by the Lord Almighty. Now, this is interesting. The word for God that Naomi uses is Shaddai. It's not El Shaddai here. It's just Shaddai. But, boy, I mean, you talk about a song in the background. Maybe we should contact Amy Grant and ask her if she can do her famous song, El Shaddai. I love that song. But in this case, uh, Naomi takes it in a very different direction. Now, Shaddai means God is powerful. God is mighty. God is sovereign. God is in control. But Naomi looks at it from the perspective of, like in Isaiah, uh, there's a passage in Joel, that this uh, Shaddai uh, is able to destroy. I think... Naomi is saying, yeah, God's been out to devastate and, and destroy me. Years ago, I was counseling someone, and he said, John, I have a very high view of the sovereignty of God, and sometimes I think it's a problem. Because he said, you know, if I believed that God wasn't in control, where God kind of sat back and said, oops, Man, I never thought that was going to happen to you. I had no idea. But he said, part of the problem with that high regard for the sovereignty of God is we believe that God is in control, that everything happens under his jurisdiction. And, and so the conflict we have is then, if God has that kind of control, why did he allow it? Why did God do that? I hope you and I would agree that that's a problem with a limited perspective on God's sovereignty. Because I could show you far more statements in the scripture that talks about Shaddai uh, being a God who has powerful love, powerful mercy, powerful grace. And so we need that kind of balanced perspective. And what happens when we have a distorted view of God's sovereignty, it leads to all kinds of faulty conclusions. One of my, well, not my favorite statements that captures my attention. Did you notice in verse 21 what Naomi says? I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Did you notice the pronouns? I went away full, the Lord brought me back empty. Now, I don't want to hurt Naomi's feelings, but did she go away full? Didn't she leave Bethlehem because there was a famine? Na Naomi, I think you've got it wrong here. And she says, I've, I've, I've come back with absolutely nothing. Uh, is that true? That she has no possessions, no people? She's just completely on her own? And yet I do get concerned when I see this level of disappointment and depression. Uh, one of my uh, favorite preachers was Haddon Robinson. Actually, in preaching class, we used his textbook. Um, 
He actually preached here a couple of times in London. He was a good friend of uh, Bill McRae when Bill McRae was here in London. Uh, Robinson shares this story about his dad. His dad passed away at age 88. During his last adult years, my father lived with us in Texas. Before that, he lived in New York City. His family lived in an area of New York called Harlem, in a section of Harlem called Mouse Town a neighborhood that Reader's Digest said was the toughest section in the United States. The two years before my father came to live with us in Dallas, he was beaten up twice by thugs. Once he was knocked down two flights of stairs and went to the hospital. The second time he was beaten up, he developed a hernia. Hans' father was a very independent, self-reliant man, but he says, my father didn't know what the hernia was. And being a man of simple, perhaps even simplistic faith, he asked God to heal him. But nothing happened. When he finally wrote to me to tell me what had occurred, it was obvious that he was deeply upset. I received his letter in the morning, and by that afternoon I was on a plane to New York. A day or two later, I brought my father back to Texas, where the surgeons successfully operated on him. Now listen to this. My father felt that somehow God had let him down. He had prayed for healing, and the healing had not occurred. I tried to explain to my father that the hand of the physician was the hand of God, but he shrugged all of that off. And the last eight years of my father's life were not good ones. Not only were those years a time of declining health, but he went through them with a diminished faith. That statement scares me. Not only were these years a time of declining health, but he went through them with a diminished faith. Some of us are older. I want to finish well. I'd like to think that my faith is as strong now as it was when I was a boy, but sometimes life can hit us hard, and we can go through difficulties and and struggles and challenges. I don't wish that on anyone, a declining faith. One of my goals in this little series from the book of Ruth is to give you hope, to inspire you, and to give you a sense that Beyond loss is great hope, and God loves you very, very much. Was Naomi empty? You're asking the question. I can read your mind. Like, what about Ruth? (laughs) Ruth is standing there. I mean, talk about awkward. Yeah, ladies, I've come back with nothing. I've got absolutely no one to help me, encourage me, support me. I would have whispered, who's that woman with you? Yeah, she looks a bit different than you, Naomi, but, but, but who is this? And keep in mind that Ruth has already promised Naomi to go to the nth degree to be loyal and committed to her. Was Naomi blinded by her burdens? She was so focused on the negatives that she couldn't see anything positive. Quick story, I remember years ago I helped coach a ball team. There was the head coach and two of us assistants. At the end of the year, there was a little party for the boys. And uh, the head coach was thanking me and the other fellow. We were up at the front. And then one of the moms, seemed like a cool moment, she came up with a little ball bat, a little baseball bat, a miniature one, that had been signed by all the boys on the team. And she handed it to the head coach. Now, wasn't that a nice gesture? And then she had a second bat that she gave to the young guy who was an assistant coach. And then it came my turn. And I didn't get anything. I'm standing up there. I I don't recall a moment where I've ever felt as awkward or embarrassed, and all the eyes were on me like, oh, this is really strange. And the poor woman seemed just oblivious to the fact that 
she had ignored me. The rest of the story, the head coach was very upset after the fact. He actually wanted to give me his little bat, and I said, no, 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 you, you keep it. I've got broad shoulders and a thick skin, and I was hurt. Didn't want to let on I was hurt, but I was really hurt. I, I feel for Ruth here. Do you feel for her? Like she's left everything to be with Naomi. But Naomi can't see it. What, what's the hardest math of all? Is it adding, subtracting, multiplying geometry? Do you, do you kind of agree that the hardest math of all is counting your blessings? Some of you already this morning have done a really good job counting your burdens. If, 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 if I could get into your head, I'd go, wow, that's impressive. I didn't know you could count that high. <laughs> count your blessings. Hey, do you know this song? When upon life's billows you're tempest-tossed, when you get discouraged thinking all is lost, count your blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort bring you to your journey's end. If you know it, sing with me. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. I'm going to give you some homework this week. I rarely do that. Your homework this week is to intentionally and deliberately count your blessings. Will you try to count up at least one or two blessings every day? Can you do that? Maybe it's counting your blessing for your spouse. You're going, oh, man, I have to do That's going to be a stretch, but you could do it. Uh, count your blessing for your family. Count the blessings of this church. We've got some wonderful, caring people at Byron Community Church. Did any, has anybody gone three or four days without food? Count your blessings for shelter and for food. Thank your blessings for Canada. This isn't a perfect country, is it? But... Boy, we've got a lot of blessing, and we'll discover next week as we're blessed, we're to be a blessing to others. So that's your assignment, and then uh, just to prepare you for it. We sang this song last week. It's one of our favorites. God is sovereign, and he is sovereignly good. And just like Naomi discovered, God is chasing after you. God is is resilient. He won't let you. He won't let your loved ones go. You might think he has. He won't. That's the God we serve. And it's because of Jesus Christ that we know God. And all honor and praise goes to Jesus. It's in his name that we have this confidence. So Joanne, Hannah, Mace, Elaine, who have I missed? Yeah, Jillian. I've got Jillian. I think I mentioned her faith, but, you know, one minute to the next I may not remember. So, Jillian, if I already mentioned you, you're being mentioned again. Uh, we need a choir. How many people would like to be part of our choir today? Okay, glad to see your hands up. Uh, so stand up with us as we close the service with this wonderful song.